From boy band to big band, Robbie Williams is the biggest success story of pop in the last 10 years. The teenage star had more number ones under his belt than any other artist of his generation. He is just the ultimate entertainer. His ability to give people what they want is second to none. For the first time ever, Liquid Assets gets behind how the cheeky chappy from Stoke became one of Britain's richest pop stars. But we've been making money since the day that we were born. We visit Dublin to reveal the real story behind Robbie's hit, Angels. Before we fall down. We've got never seen before photographs. For the first time ever, we've got access to Robbie's London pad and exclusive footage of the lost weekend that changed Robbie's life. We've got the first ever interview with Robbie's ex-managers. And we check out the small print on Robbie's 80 million deal with EMI. Robbie lives here now in L.A., but where did it all begin? Robbie Williams was born on the 13th of February, 1974. His parents, Jan and Peter, ran this pub in Stoke. And I've been told by the present landlord that we can have a sneak glimpse at the bedroom where Robbie spent the first three years of his life. And it was in this pub that Robbie's dad, Peter Conway, spent his nights entertaining the local crowd in Stoke. No doubt Robbie would have picked up a trick or two. But in 1977, Robbie, his sister and mum moved out of the pub when his parents separated. It's a far cry from LA, isn't it? Now, there is a rumour that a toddling Robbie took £2,000 of the pub's takings and threw it out of his bedroom window. An early spending spree for Master Williams. searched all over Stoke for Robbie's primary school and finally found this one. This is Mill Hill Primary, which claims to be one of Robbie's first schools, but in liquid assets, we need proof. So it's into the stock cupboard. Let's have a look for the register from 1983. Now, if I open it up here. Found him, Williams Robert Peter. He arrived on the 6th of the 9th, 83, and left again on the 26th of the 7th, 85. We also tracked down his old teacher, John Collis, who cast a young Robbie as the devil on this stage in a school play. Why did you choose him for the role? Something to do with possibly his personality at the time. Um, and I can still see him now, he's got red horns on. But in those days, we would have uh, cast as they were. And so if there were a little bit of a devil, he got the part. And it seems Robbie's indebted in more ways than one. I believe he still owes you some money. Well, yes, just turning through records. Sorry about this, Robbie. It's 1983. Um, the children would have helped sell raffle tickets to raise uh, money for the school funds. I'm afraid Robert didn't buy any, according that, to my records. That is quite incredible. Look, everybody's paid a pound here, apart from Robert Williams, number 19 in the class. Big fat zero. Having a dad who was Stokes' top entertainer had its plus points. Peter Conway pulled a few strings and got Robbie his first job at a local radio station. And it was local disc jockey Mel Scholes who gave him his first job. He was in the newsroom doing what we call rip and read, which was to do with the sport. As the, as the news came in on the sport, he used to rip it and then read through it and basically help the presenter uh, put it together and then it would go out on air. He wouldn't get paid an awful lot of money, but I would imagine around about £10 or something like that. Um, but apart from being a Saturday boy, he would even still come in during the week as well and, uh, and add to that, you know. There was one time when I called him and asked him to come in and do a few impressions for me, you know, Michael Crawford. Well, I don't know about that. And he got the bus and came over and it was pouring me rain, but he turned up. He was soaking wet and he did it, and he did it well. He did it great. I don't 
But Robbie told the Stoke DJs to rock their £10 per week job. Aged 15, a teenage Robbie went in search of something more profitable. When Nigel Martin-Smith put an ad in the Manchester Evening News for members of a new boy band, Robbie auditioned and his luck was about to change. Together, are Robbie impressed Nigel so much with his stage charisma, as seen here in this rarely seen footage, that he got the job. Despite the fact Nigel had already picked his band, he couldn't resist taking the artful Dodger on. They found me at the side of the road. <laughs> Signs say Manchester or bust. <laughs> so they decided to take me and make the numbers up. Britain's first ever boy band were formed and they were called Take That. They signed to BMG Records and Robbie received an estimated 20 grand advance. Initially aimed at the gay market, they took Clubland by storm. It wasn't long before BMG realised the boys had huge potential and there was also the female fans to consider. Jeremy Marsh, MD of BMG at the time, had the job of marketing the boys' image. There were just five guys having a good time. And what we had to do was get them on radio and also get them styled in a way that you were going to attract both boys and girls. It wasn't long before the restyle take that swept the nation. Nigel was clear from day one that this band was going to be quote, global superstars, or at, at the very least, huge at home. Modelled on new kids on the block, each boy had their own charm, and every girl had their favourite. Which one was yours? Jason the serious one, Howard the quiet one, Mark the cute one, Robbie the cheeky one, Gary the talent. Robbie was the youngest. So he was very much the, 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 the cheeky chappy, you know, the sort of the Norman wisdom of the group. The slim fast plan, I look like this. Spirits move me every time I need you. And it was choreographer Kim Gavin who had the task of getting Robbie and the boys into shape. Rob didn't want to learn the routine, or he was the slowest. So everybody else would get up and go and have a break or something. And, You'd have to go over it with him quite a few times, and uh, you know, and he'd make a joke of it. Of course, you know, that he was the last to learn it. Nigel Martin Smith was very good at marshalling the group and actually saying to them, "This is what we're doing this week or this month." And then the plan was always, after a two or three month period, to give them a week off. Sometimes they got it, sometimes they didn't. Journalist Alex Cadiz spent time with the boys on tour. The very first time I met them, I think we went down to Great Yarmouth to do a photo shoot. And I think they had to be in Leicester that same afternoon. And then they were coming back to London for another photo shoot and then going off to Manchester again. And as they got more famous, the demands increased and their workload increased. They sold a total of 10 million albums and 20 million singles. What was Robbie's share? When it comes to publishing revenues for a boy band, you only get them if you are the songwriter. And in most instances, Gary Barlow was actually the man who, who wrote most of the songs. You know, Robbie was the kind of lively one at the back, who was everyone's favourite, but wasn't writing the songs. From the record sales, Robbie would have got a fifth, an estimated £2.5 million. Pounds. So we've dragged around in limousines now. I think they all kind of thought, here's a two, three year run, and, and then let's look at what we've got. I don't think they went out and spent it as they earned it. He would knock on my door at about 11 o'clock every morning when we were staying at a hotel and order his breakfast and lunch on my expense account because they had per diems and it didn't stretch to the kind of the size of meals that he wanted. Robbie started to get bored of Take That, songwriter Gary was receiving all of the acclaim and Robbie was seen as just a dancer. Those last six months of him being in Take That, he was like a caged animal, he needed to get out. Out of my tree. <laughs> Robbie. You should say Robbie underneath. And I think he just wanted to have a good time and I think he wanted to find himself again. And I suppose one of the best ways to do that is to lose yourself totally, which is what he then proceeded to do. And I suppose one of the best ways to do that is to lose yourself totally, which is what he then proceeded to do. Robbie was becoming less interested in take that and more interested in this. So he headed off to Glastonbury and guess who he should meet? The Gallagher Brothers, the baddest boys in Britpop. 
Whilst the rest of Take That were rehearsing for their forthcoming tour, Robbie was partying at Glastonbury, as captured in this exclusive footage by Tim Abbott, MD of the Gallagher's record company at the time. We, 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 we're interview partners now, that's it. It's not, I'm saying I'm going nowhere without no one, but that's it. I'm, I can't talk. They're different. You got it. There's this guy with kind of peroxide hair, and we thought he was Freddie Starr, he was backstage, he was all that everywhere, and it was like, who's that guy with the peroxide hair, spiky hair, and it's like, oh, that's Rob Williams. Robbie was desperately trying to befriend Oasis, but did Oasis feel the same? Tim's brother and partner Chris was also there. I don't know if Liam and, and Robbie were that close ever, really. I think that it was something that the, the media really sort of made up. And here's the encore, all kicking in and take that member. Right, I admire that. When Oasis went on to play, Liam called the Robster on and he did the famous kind of duck walk on stage. To many, Robbie's Brit pop looked like twit pop. But Liam and Robbie's media friendship soon soured, ending with Liam stealing Robbie's former fiance. We've said goodbye. The taxi cab is after this lost weekend, Robbie decided he was going to leave Take That after the next tour. He gave the boys his notice, and in response, they gave him his P45. I mean, I think he feels that he was pushed, but he would have gone anyway. They came into me at rehearsal one day and said, not dictating to us when you leave, you can go now. So the actual decision was made by them, not me. Robbie's departure marked the beginning of the end for Take That. They even set up a helpline for his distraught fans. When he left, you know, we were trying to cover his leads, all his songs and everything like that. And I think what when we looked at the show, that was the bit that I went, it's a shame, you know, it's, that was his bit. After five years of hard work, Robbie walked away from Take That with an estimated £5 million. Not bad for a 21-year-old. Free from the Take That schedule, Robbie took some time off. He spent his cash on having a good time and lived his teenagers all over again. Robbie fled back to his mum's in Stoke, which is where he started forking out on his personal security. It was on this property that Robbie started to spend his take that cash, keeping the fans away from his mum's house. As you can see from the sign, security was now an issue. Despite the money spent on security gates, it wasn't secure enough. After two years, Robbie bought his mum a new house, Fort Williams Mark I. But a year later, they had to move on again. Up this mile-long driveway is the second house Robbie Williams bought for his mum. In 1999, it cost £1 million. Now, this is the nearest you can get to it, and this time security's been stepped up so much, there's even a moat. Hardly rock and roll still living at home, but by playing the property market, Robbie's made an estimated £1 million on his mum's homes, bringing his total worth to £6 million. As Robbie took care of things at home, Mum was searching for a new manager and found Kevin Kinsella. Well, I don't think Robbie was in the business for money per se. He was in it for the glamour, for the height, for everything else. But money is very important to him, driven by his mother. Well, my mum said it'd be really uncouth for me to talk about money. <laughs> he, he was quite wealthy for a you know, 20, 21 year old boy. And what was he into? He was into Charlie and vodka. And that was it. And it was Kevin's responsibility to let the world know Robbie was still in business and ready to start work again. I wrote this uh, letter that Robbie wrote to his fans and signed and that appeared on the front of the Sun paper. We worked on the uh, image that he's alive well and he would be able to continue his career. Not a career in pop though. He was still trying to get out of his Take That contract with BMG. So he took up the offer of this 7-Up campaign to tide him over. And so he stood in line with these birds and he, you know, his arse was as good as any of the others. Fabulous. And then ten days later they turned around there was Robbie right in the middle of the uh, girls, you know. Nobody had recognised it as Robbie. We were getting offers of every sort of thing. Films, uh, photo shoots, everything. 
But he wanted to be a rock singer. There was no ifs or buts. That's where he was going. To get the rock and roll image, Kevin was not the man for the job. Robbie was still tied to BMG and his Take That deal. So he ditched Kevin and called upon his old friends from the Glastonbury weekend, top indie managers Tim and Chris Abbott. One of our objectives was to replace the money he'd lost from leaving Take That. BMG didn't want to let him go. They were quite vindictive, I feel, against him at the time because they were trying to protect their interest. He was at loggerheads with Nigel Martin-Smith in the Take That camp. You know, did he leave? Was he pushed? And he was deemed as the troublemaker, and I think he killed their cash cow in a bit. You know, Take That were an immensely successful band. Our argument was he doesn't write the songs and he's not the key vocalist, and um, why are you bothered if you've got Gary and Mark ready to go? And the other two guys. BMG finally let Robbie go, freeing him of the Take That regime. But as always, there was a price to pay. With legal fees, an estimated £500,000. Gary Barlow's debut single was ready to go, so BMG released Robbie. He had to pay what you call a leaving members clause. And essentially had to buy himself out of his contract. It's a bit like when a footballer wants to leave a club um, and his contract isn't up. Robbie's new managers struck him a three-album deal with EMI and gave him an £800,000 advance. He needed a strong comeback song to knock Gary off his number one spot. He chose a track written by George Michael, who'd been through the same process himself. No, not that one. You're not in a boy band anymore, Robbie. You need the mature solo version. made in five days and out a week later they tend that generally doesn't tend to happen that was the you know we mixed it on a Saturday and they were cutting it on a Monday to be out the following Monday Gary Barlow's single went straight in at number one and Robbie needed the same success to steal his thunder he was not around a huge amount of time not because he didn't want to be I'm sure they were shooting the video simultaneously while we were making the making the record but things didn't go to plan for Robbie new entry this week and number two is freedom by Robbie Williams Still a number one for the or Gary who was knocked off the number one spot not by Robbie but a new pop sensation the Spice Girl. I mean the whole point of the record was to get to number one that we've signed Robbie Williams this is the first single it'll be number one next week that's what they were that's what they were banking on Freedom was a fantastic success for him, I think, around the world. In 17 territories, he was top five, he had a couple of number ones, but he didn't get the number one in Britain. Well, I think as an entertainer, we were looking more for George Michael, and what we actually got was George Formby. It bought him a bit of time while they could work out exactly what they wanted to do with him musically. It was Chris who was trying to keep tabs on Robbie, spending his huge advance. I remember buying him a, a Game Boy uh, at an airport and he would play it for about three or four hours non-stop and then would just leave it behind somewhere and think nothing of it so you'd have to go and get him another one where, oh I've left that one sort of uh, on the plane, it's like Rob. The Abbots also had the job of ridding Robbie of his boy band image, but he was getting out of control. He went to the right places, the right openings, and, and, and started going to too many, really. Robbie made an estimated £50,000 from Freedom, but it was deemed a flop. Now his cocaine habit was taking him more towards rehab rather than rehashes of George Michael's solo career. It seemed Robbie's future was now playing cover versions at award ceremonies. But would he be able to maintain a solo career? Nice to be back. Robbie was becoming a difficult artist to manage, so in October 1996 he parted with managers number three. To get away from the London nightlife, Robbie headed off on holiday to Dublin. There he met Ray Heffernan, who was to become his guardian angel. So Ray, this is where you met Robbie, tell me about it. Well yeah, it was one Saturday afternoon. 
Um, and Robbie Williams walked in here and uh, came over to us and we started a chat um, and we started a drink and we had made a night out of it. They hit it off and Robbie ended up crashing at Ray's. And the next morning uh, he got up before me and went down to the kitchen and I had four sisters so, uh, who were around the kitchen table and, uh, uh, you know, hello I'm Rob, you know, <laughs> okay. with an acoustic guitar and, and a dictaphone at six o'clock in the morning, you know, and uh, keeping the family awake, you know. Ray kept the demo for years and for the first time ever you can hear the recording. It may be crackly, but it's unmistakably angels. He wasn't in a particularly good place. It was at the time when he was going out on the town a lot, and you know he was, um, he wasn't a particularly happy guy at the time. So I think he bought into the faith idea, you know, keeping your faith when when times are difficult, you know. When I'm lying in my bed, thoughts running through my head. He liked that um, on the spiritual side of it. And loving angels instead. And I think we both knew right right from the start that it was a good idea, and that it was. It was, uh, it, was, it was one of those songs that, comes, that came really, really natural. Since the release of Freedom, Robbie's singles had had little chart success. EMI needed a hit, and Robbie desperately needed a songwriter. EMI then found Robbie IE Management, who had worked with Brian Ferry. IE saw the potential in Robbie and paired him up with producer and songwriter Guy Chambers. Robbie handed Guy a Dublin version of Angels in the hope he could do something with it. Guy added a chorus and made it into an anthem. which is for births, weddings and deaths, you know, everybody wants to play angels, you know, and it's become a classic, you know, and it was in the charts for months, it started to sell around, you know, it started to get him noticed in Europe and uh, around the world, so I think it was the turning point. Life Through a Lens was not the success expected, but Angels pushed it back into the charts and in less than four months it had gone triple platinum, as had Robbie's credit card. But it wasn't payday for Ray. I heard that the song was, was, was on the album, so I contacted his management company and said, look, I did have a, a part in that. They offered me a few quid and a credit on the, on the single sleeve, which I got. And at the time, I was much more interested in the acclaim than, than, a, than a money. The strongest moment for me was being in Slain and hearing 80,000 people singing it. And Robbie didn't sing it. You know, Robbie doesn't sing it live. The crowd sings it. Tommy. Robbie made an estimated one million pounds from Angels alone. That's a total of £7.3 million. Angels wasn't as lucrative for Ray, but it got him the critical acclaim he wanted. I'm rich! Be on my wildest! Er, uh, not quite yet, Robbie, but you're getting there. With a pocket full of cash, the world's your oyster. Robbie started hanging out with the in crowd and hit London in style. VIP all the way.
Robbie now had another excuse to celebrate and became the face about town. He got the celebrity girlfriends such as Anna Friel and Nicole Appleton, and even attempted stints in rehab. IE management not only held the reins in his career, but started to advise his personal investments. First off was spending on a new pad all of his own. Liquid Assets has been given an exclusive key to the first gaff that Robbie bought when he came to London. This is the kitchen area. It's around the time that he was going out with Nicole Appleton that he had this place. You can imagine her maybe doing the washing up next to this very exclusive kind of looking sink there. Into the kitchenette area. Now, we are one of the first people to see this flat, and we do believe that it's actually got some of the original features that Robbie put in it, like these blinds. He's obviously not too bothered about prying eyes here, because the blinds don't go up all that far. Okay, through to the bedrooms. Many people will be very jealous of where I'm about to go, into Robbie's former bedroom. As you can see, it's quite a nice, spacious room. There's a rather small bathroom there and then where would a pop star's house be without a walk-in wardrobe enough room in there for all your Dolce and Cabana and Versace and moving on we have got the piers de resistance the swanky rock and roll living room and this is the room you probably see the most evident of Robbie Williams here is the massive lounge area again not too bothered about privacy here open windows no blinds but come and have a look at this this is the doorbell, which apparently lights up when you ring the doorbell because Robbie played his music so loud, perhaps, that he needed to see a flashing light rather than hear a doorbell. Come around here. Hook for one Robbie Williams punch bag when he was getting fit. And the mini bar area, not so fit. When I was young. Robbie was now starting to reap the benefits, not only of his profits, but of the advice from his managers, i.e. This spacious living room is in the heart of London's exclusive Notting Hill Gate. Liquid Assets estimates Robbie bought this gaff for £500,000, then doubled his money, selling it on two years ago for a million pounds. So that's £500,000 profit on his first flat, making a total of £7.8 million. But still, Robbie was not spending enough time investing in his health. There was an alternative side to, you know, his sort of rambunctiousness, which was always very funny, but there was a time when he'd really just started to slip off the rails on the odd occasion, and he'd got very drunk and misjudged the size of a pool of water, thought it was more than six inches deep, and it wasn't. He dived into it head first and split his head open, and um, that's really all I saw, because with instances like that, the inner circle closed in, and people like myself didn't get to see the end result, other than that afterwards he had to explain a scar on his head, and I mean... He was concussed. He, it made him quite ill doing that. With the success of Angels, Robbie still needed that difficult second album and got yet another old idea out of the cupboard. We took former manager Chris Abbott back to an old studio in Wales where he and Oasis producer Owen Morris originally came up with the idea for Millennium. Wow. Not quite Abbey Road, is it? I brought up a John Barry. CD which had uh, You Only Live Twice and and um, thought the strings were great um, said this to Owen, Owen loved it uh, said if you loop it put a break beat behind it I think we have the basis for a good track once again, Guy Chambers turned an old idea into a major hit, and it became Robbie's first solo number one. Throughout Robbie's solo career, he has made an estimated £5 million from his single sales. It was at this time Robbie and his new management saw potential with his image and started to cash in on videos and DVDs with the help of longtime video director Vaughan Arnell. I phoned up Robbie and said, what do you want? What would you like, sir? And he said, I'd really want to be James Bond. So we sort of came up with this idea. We are speaking backwards and forwards on the phone about different wardrobe looks, you know, the sort of uh, Sean Connery, the Roger Moore type thing. This video was so successful, there was speculation in the press that Robbie was going to be the next Bond. Or at least he hoped so. 
Vaughan is still making promo videos with Robbie today and is no stranger to his radical ideas. I think the best thing about Robbie is he thinks more about the track rather than himself and the long term thing. So it was more like he just said, let's do like a real big rock video and like a, you know, with all the makeup and everything. And everybody's faces, when we presented the idea, just you could just see the fear in their face, which was brilliant. As the budgets increase for Robbie's videos, so has the celebrity of his co-stars. Well, there's been Kylie and Daryl Hannah. Robbie and his management took the opportunity to release a DVD of his Christmas number one single with Nicole Kidman. When you got like Robbie and Nicole there, it was really weird who to talk to first. But Mr. Williams, because he was paying for it. Along with the million dollar co-star, went the multi-million pounds worth of props. I think they had about 25 million pounds on the set. And it came down with these, there were like two bodyguards and somebody from the jewellers. And then what would happen, what, the worst bit was, um, I think it was about two million pound necklace and we were filming and uh, Robbie was trying to open it to get it round Nicole's neck and he, Robbie just thought it was a prop one and he was literally bending it and everybody's faces were like really staring and gasping and then every time it came off the set there'd be somebody with a little monocle counting all the little diamonds. So when we had to take the handbag off Nicole they were like counting all the little diamonds off the heart. And we managed to get a closer look at the watch that Robbie wore on set. So this is the watch. Um, it's a chronograph. Look at that sparkle. It's very pretty. It's got some mother of pearl. It's got both white diamonds and black diamonds on the dial and also basically on the case and on the strap. So it's a very nice watch. If you have a feel, it feels beautiful. It's a little bit of heavy. Oh, that's very heavy. I'm a bit scared. So when you have something like this, it's obviously, I mean, how much is this worth? That's worth £50,000. £50,000? 50, Correct. And exactly. how many diamonds are in there? There's about three and a half carats of diamonds in total weight. So it's, it's a nice watch. It's not too overly expensive. It's, it's just, you know... That's not nice. too overly expensive! <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you know, we have items that are much, worth much more. Did you get any feedback off Robbie? I mean, did he say, can I have it, please? <laughs> he liked the watch. Robbie and his managers have raked in an estimated total of four million pounds, bringing his total to 16.8 million quid. All good celebrities like to share their wealth around, and Robbie is no exception. In 2001, he auctioned off some personal items here at Sotheby's. Robbie has worked for various charities and even set up his own called Give It Some. At the auction, those famous rock DJ pants were sold for £5,000. His bed fetched 13 grand. Giving to charity also has personal benefits for Robbie. I do my bit to give back and I'm going to be doing more of that, a lot more, because I suffer with tremendous guilt myself. Robbie has travelled far and wide in his capacity as UNICEF ambassador, going to places as far afield as Sri Lanka and Mozambique. In December 2000 in London, he even went as far as personally demolishing walls for AIDS awareness. And of course, Robbie never misses an opportunity to bring some humour to his work. Hey, you know, if you men paid more attention to these instead of these, then maybe fewer of us would be dying of testicular cancer. So go and check them out. Robbie's parted with personal earnings amounting to an estimated three million pounds for charity. In giving money to charity, there are twofold advantages really to Robbie. On the one hand you get tax breaks, on the other hand you obviously enhance your own reputation. Um, Robbie is someone who's been badly behaved in the past but people are more likely to forgive him things. He knows that if he's given it all to Comet Relief. But there's also the cash Robbie hasn't given away voluntarily. He is, has always had litigation around him. He lives in that world and um, you know he's the lawyer's best friend in a way. Robbie had to pay former Take That manager, Nigel Martin-Smith, who declined to comment what we estimate with court costs to be £600,000. And he wasn't the only manager Robbie had to pay. There was Kevin Kinsella. I'm not going to say how much it was, but it was nice money. We estimate with court fees, Kevin cost Robbie £500,000. And then there was the Abbott brothers. They eventually settled. Um, 
and acknowledge that there was a contract in place. And I think now Rob probably realises that um, the record deal which we negotiated for them has put him in this situation where he is today negotiating one of the biggest record contracts out. The Abbots reportedly got over a million pounds. The cost of three former managers plus court fees amounts to a total of 2.4 million. When it comes to cars, Robbie's a real big spender with a flash fleet all of his own. A 1974 E-Type Jag is Robbie's prized possession, a snip at £40,000. Famously, Robbie once bought a £100,000 Ferrari. He felt so guilty, though, at spending all that cash that he sent it back before it was delivered. You get the number plate, though. Robbie can be seen swanning around in a modern-day classic, a £60,000 XKR. After doing a deal with Smart Cars, who sponsor his tours, Robbie bought his mum her very own runaround. Perfect for nipping down to the shops to buy your loving son's latest release. With his newfound recording success came the inevitable tours. His biggest gig to date was at Slane Castle outside Dublin, in front of 80,000 people. Andy Franks has been Robbie's tour manager for seven years. It was an amazing day, it was an amazing show. I mean, he was so nervous beforehand, he was absolutely sort of bricking it, you know. Because he does, he does get very, very nervous, you know, before he goes on stage, because even though the band, the production, everything's going, he knows that the show basically rests on his shoulders. And no matter how much you've got going on, pyrotechnics or anything, you know, people are watching him. But tours on this scale don't come cheap. We've got 18 people on stage. Um, there's 35 people in the band party. There'll be a private plane that will have to fly around because of the logistics of being able to get everybody from A to B. There's all the buses, there's the trucks, as I said, there's all the hotels, there's, you know, just paying 200 people's wages. Although it's just him, you know, everybody else has to be paid. It's great being on a Robbie tour, but you can't ask someone to do it for free. A ticket to a Robbie gig can cost up to £200, but you're guaranteed to get your money's worth. To add to Robbie's tour costs are his outfits, some of which have been exclusively designed by Taylor Nick Hart. So we're here in Savile Row. Has yep. Robbie actually ever been in the shop? No, he hasn't, no. He, he's a very busy man and um, I, I've basically visited his various houses. Yeah. You're a girl who understands. So Nick, what kind of things did you get Robbie into? Well, one of the key pieces, which was kind of to do with the Rat Pack bling bling sort of scene, was this um, shawl suit. This is a very, very sort of fitted kind of 60s type shawl jacket. And the fabric which I designed was a herringbone fabric with a company called Moxon, who are probably the most exclusive in England and one of the most exclusive in the world. No, you, and now I've met Miss Jones. Are we talking about a lot of money for an exclusive fabric? We are talking about a lot of money, yeah. I mean, a fabric like this is um, about as expensive as it gets. Take it away, fellas! Robbie liked the suit for his Pinewood special so much, he decided to order eight of them. And it's not just the cost of the fabric you're paying for. We lined the, um, the jacket with a white shirting fabric, again, to create texture and richness, so that when Robbie took it off or when he's swinging around, you could actually see the fabric. How much would one of those cost? Well, this coat's about £900. Possibly the best investment you could ever make in your life. When he, he did the Pinewood special, they invited me down to go and sort of look after things, to make sure that things like the white handkerchief was in, in exactly the right, you know, angle in his shawl suit and things like that. You know, it's all about those very, very small details that people can't put their finger on. 
It's not all rock and roll on Robbie's tours. If he threw the TV out of the window, he'd probably regret it. He's probably one of the least sort of demanding people I know, you know. He just, he just likes a little room that he can sit in and be himself. He likes to have a, a, a music system that he can play stuff on. You know, sometimes we have a TV with some video games and that's kind of it, you know. It's the, the reality is it's a bit boring. To get a ticket to a Robbie gig, you have to be quick. His 2003 tour sold out in record time. And his Nebworth dates beat Oasis all-time record by two hours. It was an unbelievable day, you know. The tickets were just, I mean, I, I think they, they sold 650,000 tickets in that day, you know. Being the son of a variety performer, Robbie knows the value of being an all-round family entertainer, and so does his management. Pushing this image has made Robbie an estimated five million from touring and merchandise, bringing his total worth to 16.3 million pounds. One of Robbie's favourite pastimes is playing computer games. It's no wonder he was overjoyed when the sponsored deal started to roll in from one of the biggest computer companies in the UK. Robbie won't work with just anybody. You know, he wants to work with things that he's into or enjoys or has an interest in. He is, an, you know, the icon along with Beckham in the UK. Everybody knows him. Um, his music, you know, he's selling best-selling albums all the time. What's in it for Robbie? Well, what Robbie gets out of it is a couple of consoles um, and also, you know, we'll be able to actually potentially bring Robbie Williams to a wider audience in countries where he's, you know, trying to crack. And it's not just a few consoles. Sponsors also pay for his tours, increasing that profit margin no end. Robbie's been sponsored by the likes of Pepsi, Smart Cars and Lloyds to the tune of £2 million. Pounds. Whatever we're paying him, um, and his entourage is probably, you know, uh, a rounding error in what he earns every year. So that's all I'm going to say. How do you feel about all these bands who mime on stage? Miming? I think that's disgusting. Never see me doing that. When you're an artist, the least you can do is respect your fans, put your heart into the show. You know what I mean? And that's very important to me. Thank you, guys. See you later. By 2001, Robbie Williams had reached the peak of his career and cleared up at every award ceremony. But behind the scenes, the real Robbie was finding fame hard to cope with and was battling with his demons. Was it burnout time again for Robbie? Not sure I understand. Announcing he was taking a year off, he moved to America, but not to just any old gap. Robbie lived here at a property owned by Dan Aykroyd for half a year, paying £12,000 a month for the honour. Now he's got a place all of his own. And it's here that Robbie's purchased his first LA home on an exclusive estate for £3.5 million. Pounds. I just want to feel Liquid Assets gained an exclusive interview with Robbie's estate agent, Barry Sloan, who gave us a tour of a property in Mr. Williams Manor. Right, Barry, we're now through to the pool area. You're a star, prone to putting on a little bit of weight from time to time. What is the key thing that you want out of your pool area? <laughs> well, um, taking off the weight is important, but having the privacy while you're doing it is the most important thing. So here, for example, uh, you've got no one looking in, it's a great idyllic environment and that's what people really want. Um, the sense of privacy here is the most important thing. You can always have a helicopter go over and take a shot and for people like Madonna that's always a really important factor, but you can't control that so much. I can see myself coming. Okay, Barry, if you're a star like Robbie, there's another key feature that you probably wouldn't get in the UK and that is the guest house. What's good about a guest house? Well, the great thing here is you've got a guest house really on a separate street and with a separate address. So if someone gets your address, God forbid, you could come in the back way, which is really great. This is a different street to the street this we came in on. Entirely different street, different name, different number, different everything. Well, you've sold it to me, Barry. Think I could certainly feel at home here. Just a bit worried about the cost. If somebody like Robbie was to buy somewhere like this in the Hollywood Hills, how much would he be spending? He'd be spending about $3 million here. Could go up to five, six, seven million without any problems. 
And we also track down the London home Robbie uses to pop back for the odd gig and, of course, to visit Mum. This is Robbie's second home which he paid over £2 million for. After installing a platinum pool table, 12-seater sofa and glass staircase, he spent over £1 million on refurbishments. If you add together his Hollywood and UK homes, not to forget those purchased for Mum, his total property assets are £7 million. Bringing his total worth to an estimated £25.3 million. After his year off in L.A., Robbie returned to the U.K. to find he had some renegotiations to do. This time round, it wasn't so difficult to find any takers. When Robbie's record deal expired, a bidding war began. And it was EMI who got to keep him, paying £80 million for the pleasure. I'm rich beyond my wildest dreams! And yes, this time you are, Robbie. But don't buy that yacht just yet. The deal was reported to be 80 million, but Robbie didn't quite get a cheque for that much. He's got 10 million pounds. I think he was paid that on signing. Another 15 million pounds when he delivered Escapology. Now, it may be that that 15 million pounds included the recording costs on Escapology. He will then be paid further instalments of the advance when EMI exercise options to acquire further product. So Robbie actually got 25 million, not the rumoured 80. But what do EMI get for their money? Well, first of all, there's those record sales. Robbie's first solo album, Light Through a Lens, sold 3.2 million copies. His second, I've Been Expecting You, sold 4.4 million. Sing When You're Winning sold 5.3 million copies. Robbie's fourth album, Swing When You're Winning, sold 5.8 million copies. As for Robbie's latest album, Escapology, it sold 4.4 million copies in its first five weeks. Robbie has sold over 22 million albums worldwide, making £10 million from record sales. EMI have bought into, or have been given, the opportunity to acquire 25% of Robbie's service company, which gives them a right to 25% of the profit from Robbie's other activities, such as touring, merchandising, sponsorship endorsement, not publishing, but with other activities. Robbie and his management set up a company to manage the all-new Robbie Williams Inc. called the In Good Company. There has been speculation that EMI are concerned they won't recoup the maximum profits unless he breaks America. It's just a huge, huge territory. If he can break America, then he can make a lot of money, and EMI can get their money back that much quicker. Robbie's yet to make it in the States, where he's still getting confused for this fella. Can I ask you a quick question? Do you know who Robbie Williams is? Robin Williams? No, Robbie Williams. Robbie Williams, no. Robbie Williams, no, I don't know. Who is Robbie Williams? Uh, Robbie Williams. Gee, I wish I knew. Thank you. Oh. Since when? It seems like he's got some work to do here. He had one go already in 2000, which wasn't too successful. We were doing like four or five hundred capacity sort of venues. I mean, fortunately they were all sold out, you know. Um, the first place we played in New York, the Bowery Ballroom, I think that holds about sort of 300 people, 350 people. They were doing a webcast from there as well. So, I mean, it was just impossible to try and get everybody on it. Will he be more successful the second time round? We asked Jeff Pollock, who helps to break major UK artists in the US, what he thought. Angels was a great song and is a great song. Uh, it was a song that should have been a gigantic hit here. And unfortunately for Robbie, the US label was unable to deliver any hits at the time. You have to really be lucky to have a song that fits on more than just one format. And to really make it big in America, you have to be a multi-format star. You, you can't just you know, be big on a rock station and not get played on a top 40 or not get played on a pop station. I have a feeling that Robbie won't break America. I think he's too funny. I think Robbie's all about irony. And I don't know if the Americans really understand irony that well. It's harder for acts that have you know, are playing Nebworth or Slane or playing these huge festivals and suddenly are asked to open a small little club or they go to these various cities and find out that the radio stations don't know who they are. A new shirt for a new song. What's it called? 
No fear. But there could be one major snag for Robbie and his new deal. He not only sacked his lawyers and accountants, he also part a company with longtime collaborator Guy Chambers, who co-wrote nearly all of Robbie's songs. No, no fear. I'd just be very surprised if Rob can find someone to work like that again. I think he's going to get into that thing of, of using the same old riders that everybody uses. Guy had a big control over the band and the influence. He, he knew the songs inside out probably better than anybody else apart from Rob, you know. So having someone around like that was a help to, to all of us because he knew how it should be. Guy is now said to be working with artists such as Blue and Robbie's old Spice Flames, Mel C and Jerry. There have been reports that Guy and Robbie's relationship ended acrimoniously. I never, ever once asked for an exclusivity, whatever you call it, I can't even say it, um, deal with Guy, you know. It was never, and it has never been ever about that at all, you know. It's about him wanting too much money. Now, did I say that? You know, I read an awful lot about Guy Chambers who penned the, the, the hit Let Me Entertain You and the hit Angels, and it pissed me off. These are my albums. I, I have a lot to do with them, believe it or believe it not. But unless you're in a room with me watching me write, how would you know? He walks around the room and he gets an idea, he walks around and he shouts out lyrics and writes some down and it's, a, it's all very um, listing off rhymes and stuff uh, and he needs somebody to, to sit beside him to kind of uh, go through it and structure stuff. Um, modern day poet, I don't know. Uh, master of the one-liner, yes. I want to continue to break records and make records with EMI. I thought that all by myself. But it is clear out Robbie didn't sack IE management, a very wise move. It seems that business now could make Robbie's career long term if he has the stamina. America is a very important part of the world but you could still sell clearly 10 million albums without going anywhere near it. And, and I think a lot is down to Rob and what he wants to do. I'm really not interested in breaking America. It's too much hard work. I'll be a new artist there. I, I can't be asked. So, if Robbie isn't interested in breaking America, what does he do with his days? Liquid Assets was on his trail. No regrets. Well, a clean living Robbie has to attend a daily AA meeting here in West Hollywood to keep himself on the straight and narrow. He can walk down the street here and no one will approach him. He can go to AA as he does and they just think he's a funny English guy with a strange haircut. Bizarrely enough, when the sun's shining all year round here, he still goes and has a suntan at uh, a tanning salon. He goes to his coffee bean, goes and buys DVDs and CDs. Quite, um, quite boring, really. Yeah, we, we've got him coming out of tattoo parlours. Again, it's just one of the things he does when he comes to LA. He, he goes and has a tattoo done. He's running out of space. Would you believe if he has any more spare time, he comes to yet another AA meeting here in a car park. What are you going to do with the cat, Robbie? What am I going to do with it? I'm going to count it all. <laughs> Robbie also spends his time getting himself the next celebrity girlfriend and desperately trying to keep them. Over the years, there's been Nicole, Jerry, Rachel, Tanya, Jackie, Kylie. If he doesn't crack America, IE management will make sure he carries on entertaining us in some way. It's in his blood. I think he's going to be in the public eye for a long time. He's got to be very strong to cope with that. So I think EMI will be very unhappy if they've got a performance target in America if Robbie said, no, I'd much rather perform in Butlins. So what is Robbie Williams, Inc. worth? If you take into account his homes, his EMI deal, his cars and his tours, After Tax gives us our exclusive liquid assets total of £60 million. But EMI could double that if Robbie feels he wants to.
sold albums to nearly every home in Europe and claims he doesn't care about America. But for someone who always fought back and hates second place, surely he can't resist the challenge. Now that LA is Robbie's new home, only time will tell if the cheeky chappy from Stoke can win the hearts of America. When he goes out on that stage, when he gives his performance, it's just an incredible show, you know.